Be a baller. Welcome to Be a Baller podcast, where we discuss how to build a lifelong legacy. I'm your host, Coach Tim Brown. Today, we'll be talking about building a legacy and service to the community with our special guest, Adam Troy. Before we get started, let's hear a word from our sponsor. The City of Refuge Good Life Foundation is a 501c3 organization that is an affiliate of the First Church of God, led by Bishop Timothy Joseph Clark. Our vision is that everyone will have a better life through the establishment of a stable and sustainable home environment. We serve all residents of Central Ohio with a focus on residents in Southeast Columbus who are TANF eligible and or who fall at or below the federal poverty guidelines. We accomplish our mission in four targeted areas. They are workforce development, mother's initiatives and infant mortality, youth training, mentoring and development, and college preparedness for youth from impoverished backgrounds. To learn more, please visit our website at www.corgoodlifefoundation.org. That's www.cor goodlifefoundation.org. Uh, today on the Be A Baller podcast, we're excited to have Adam here. Adam is currently serving the community in the Linden area as the CEO of New Salem Baptist Church Community of Karen Development Foundation. Uh, Adam will talk about the importance of being intentional and in serving and uplifting our community. Thanks for being a guest on Be A Baller podcast. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, looking forward to the, to the discussion today. Yeah. I, uh, first of all, we got to talk about the style of the choice. You know? <laughs> Everybody has that unique style. style. We're, where, where did the dress, where did you know, all that come from? And you, all, you all might as well have your own brand. Our mother, man. Okay. Um, and not that she was, uh, I think, so intentional about it. What's inter- interesting is that, you know, we have no sisters. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so it was all four boys. But our mother just modeled that. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, the joke actually about dad is that... Um, Nobody's ever seen that until recently without a tie. No, so whether he was mowing the grass or, or <laughs> preaching a sermon, that's just how we thought it was supposed to be. So I think we just emulated what we saw. Wow. Wow. You know, you grew up in Warren, Ohio, and then you moved to Columbus for your junior, senior year of high school. How was that transition coming from Warren to Columbus, Ohio? Yeah, I'm smiling, man, because <laughs> it was tough. Yeah. Um, we moved here in 76, Tim, and I was a junior in mm. high school. And, you know, when you're a junior in oh, high yeah. school, you kind of feel like you're coming into your prime. Right, right, right. And uh, so we left Warren, uh, moved here. Um, and for people who know us, um, we talk about the, the 216. That's the area code mm-hmm. for, for Warren, Ohio. Our home was like three streets over from the project. So mm-hmm. when we moved to Columbus, that was like a whole new world for right, us. Right. It felt very um, suburban, <laughs> if you will. Mm-hmm. And then uh, to top it all off, when we moved here in 76 was the first year of busing. Mm-hmm. And so even though I live by technically I could walk to Mifflin mm-hmm. High School, mm-hmm. I got bused to Brookhaven. So. Oh, wow. It was a little bit of a culture shock, man, but made friends fairly quickly mm-hmm. at uh, Brookhaven. And, you know, when you play basketball, you get a chance to get around the city and meet everybody who's out there. So right. that helped. Basketball actually helped uh, tremendously in my transition. Good, good, good. Your dad was on the podcast earlier this year. Uh, can you talk about growing up as a, a PK, a pastor's kid? <laughs> <laughs> So I know. <laughs> yeah, all the PKs are like, just don't give away the secrets right, right. out there. Um, but not only was, uh, you know, dad, you know, we would preach as kids, but particularly in Warren, mm-hmm. that was also president of the school board. Oh, wow. Um, and so you had sort of this double shadowed expectation. Mm-hmm. Um, but I tell folks this all the time, man, you know, you can't get the benefits without the burdens. Mm-hmm. And, you know, certainly being a preacher's kid came with a fair amount of its benefits. Mm -hmm. It also came with a fair amount of expected burdens that you just go through in adolescence. There are things that your friends do that you can't necessarily do. Mm -hmm. Um, There are places that they go that you can't necessarily go. But it puts you in a position early on Mm -hmm. to help you understand what your responsibility is, Mm -hmm. even to your peer group, in terms of modeling what um, hopefully good behavior and and, uh, maximizing your potential can look like. So it wasn't easy, but we, we navigate. Them. Right. That's a great point. Can you talk about maybe one of those experiences you had where, you know, the guys are going one way and you're thinking, no, my dad, 
my dad don't, my mom and dad don't play this. Shit. <laughs> you know, I, I, can't, I, I can't do that. You know. Um, should my family see this po- podcast? Yeah. Um, and, and here's what they're going to remember. Mm-hmm. Um, Eric, my younger brother, there's only two years difference okay. between us. And Tim, I promise you, like literally for, I don't know, man, five or six years, we probably got a whooping every day. Okay. I mean, we were just guys <laughs> who were just always right. out there, right? right. right. <laughs> and so we were in perfect position to tell our friends, there's just some things right. that you do not you know, right. want to do. Right. There was one incident where um, we had, uh, you know, we didn't have car access. And so we rode our bikes Mm -hmm. all over the city, which is not something kids do nowadays, right? Mm -hmm. Rode our bikes all over the city. Um, And on one instance, uh, Eric and I had gone with a group of our friends to the drive-thru theater Mm -hmm. across town. Um, And we got back after curfew. Mm -hmm. We learned from that because our father had um, uh, applied education, if you will. (laughs) The next time that opportunity presented itself, Tim, we were in a position to say, guys, um, we're not going down that route. If y'all choose to go to the drive through on your on your uh, bikes, that's fine. We'll see y'all tomorrow Saturday at the football field. So, you know, sometimes you just have to you learn about it by going through it. Right. I think we learned a lot about those street lights. No doubt. No (laughs) doubt. No doubt. Yeah. We we, when they came on, we were in trouble. (laughs) We were in trouble. We knew knew where to be. (laughs) Speaking of that, uh, can you talk about Detroit name and what it stands for in the community? I would like to think that, um, you know, it's almost if you take the the first letters of our last name, it's, it's essentially how we, I think, try to hold up a standard. Mm-hmm. You know, that T in Troy, ultimately for all of us, it's about trust mm-hmm. and integrity. We may not always agree, but you can trust that our perspective mm-hmm. and our movement is coming from a genuine place and mm-hmm. not one that's that's typically self-centered. So, so the T in Troy stands for trust. The R, as you probably can guess, or as most people probably, most people know us, is really about be relational. Mm-hmm. Yes. It doesn't matter where you find people, whether you're speaking to people who are working the front desk or you're going to meet with the CEO, mm-hmm. right? Be relational. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's sort of in our, our DNA. And so the R stands for uh, being relational. O is just always looking for the opportunity um, to bridge relationships mm. or to do something good, right? Mm. Don't be blind mm. um, to what's out there, what's in front of you, and understand what your responsibility um, in your space is in right. that particular time. The Y, interesting enough, is about the you. Uh, but not the you. In fact, I've cultivated this in pretty much everything that we do. Everybody who works with us uh, in Linden tied to the Development Foundation has these bands. And as you can see, this band says, I see you. Mm. Uh, on the other side, it says, um, call in all connectors. Mm. The point is, as we grew up, it was about the you should be beyond the optics. Take mm. the time to understand what that person might be going through. Mm. Where did they come from? What was the effort that it took to get them there? White, black, red, or brown, young or old? And so that T is about trust. The R is about being relational. The R is uh, the O is opportunity, and the U is just always seeing people beyond the optics. So hopefully we've right. we've lived up to that standard. Oh, so you guys definitely have. Well, you done gave me some work to do, man. <laughs> my last name Brown. It just stands for the color. <laughs> You know, people say, Brian, hey, we just just a color. You're smart guy, man. You'll figure it out. Yeah, I'm going to figure that one out. Man. I got to flip that. you figure it out. Yeah. You know, there's a big focus on HBCU schools now. Yeah. You know, that's the big buzz where everybody's talking about those. You you and your brothers um, had the experience by actually attending Morehouse College. And attending Morehouse College, how did that prepare you for the community work you do today? Fair question. Um, you know, our, our Morehouse legacy actually started with my brother Keith. Mm-hmm. Um, who, again, graduated, I think, in 76 uh, from Warren Restaurant Reserve in, in, in Warren, Ohio, and ended up going to Morehouse College, which none of us had heard of. Mm. Um, there is six years difference mm-hmm. between Keith and myself, and then Eric is, is two years behind me. I can remember he sent for us one summer, mm. uh, and Eric and I had a chance to go and visit. And Tim, it was the first time that I think we got a glimpse of what 
black excellence could look mm-hmm. like. Like this was all African American people mm-hmm. performing at the highest level. And I think uh, Morehouse at that particular point in time left an indelible impression uh, upon uh, our entire family and certainly me. Um, I had uh, a scholarship actually to go to Brown Mm. uh, University in Providence. The mistake they made was bringing me there in February. Okay. <laughs> and so yeah, I go there yes, yeah, and uh, man, it was just, bro, it was yeah. just, oh my gosh, yeah. it was just blistering mm. cold. Um, and so I made up my mind to apply to, um, to Morehouse, went down there. And what I realized early on um, was that we didn't have to apologize mm. for who we were. Mm-hmm. That that, and almost, you know, Wakanda forever about to come out, it felt yeah. that way, right. you know? And so what Morehouse prepared us for is that um, Dr. Benjamin Mays, who's often touted as the father of, of Morehouse, uh, we had this saying, which was, above the heads of her students, Mm. Morehouse holds a crown that it challenges them to grow tall enough to wear. Mm. So every day it was about, are you reaching the crown? Mm. And for me, that's allowed me to carry that mantra forward into places like Linden, saying there's a different standard now Mm. that we're here. Mm. Right. And every day we're trying to challenge people, grow tall enough to to wear the mantle of Lyndon. There's a proud history there, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, Of people who worked hard, who sacrificed for you to be there. And so Morehouse gave us the standard. Mm -hmm. Morehouse also provided, uh, I think, the wherewithal to learn how to deal um, with different personalities, um, different cultures, Mm -hmm. and to be respectful in that sense and to always make sure that uh, my brother off my brother Keith often says this Morehouse was true to this if you were the smartest cat in the room then you need to be in a different room <laughs> and so at Morehouse there was always another oh, room for you yeah. to be in so I'd like to yeah. think that it prepared us both academically mm-hmm. but also just in terms of, of service uh, and being uh, strong standard bearers mm-hmm. for the community oh, that's awesome you know you've been a successful real estate development company on the management uh, why did you get involved in serving the lender community full time as the CEO of the, of the New Salem Church uh, Community of Care and Development Foundation yeah uh, I would like to think man that it wasn't so much Tim uh, me choosing Lyndon mm-hmm. as it felt like Lyndon chose me mm-hmm. um, as some people know I was in Six or seven years ago, I was in Detroit for a couple of years, and then I came back to Columbus. And um, my brother at that time, who was a pastor over at New Salem, asked me to consider sitting in the seat as our missions director, right. but also overseeing the community development initiative. And at that time, we were singularly focused on what we call the Golden Triangle. That mm-hmm. was essentially the five or six blocks around the church, right. mm-hmm. about 197 families. And the goal was, could we focus um, our relationships and our resources over a 36 month period of time, three years, mm-hmm. and build a demonstration project to hold up to everybody else to say, all right, doesn't matter what your ethnicity is, doesn't matter where you come from, but with focus resources and relationships, this is what the model could look like. The mayor at that time was just about, was beginning to roll out one Columbus. Mm -hmm. And um, the mayor and his people came to see us. And what began to happen is as we're very big on data. Mm -hmm. And so as we put in the zip code for our membership, what we found was that there was a few hundred people who were New Salem members who lived all throughout Linden. Mm -hmm. And so by, by proximity and membership, it sort of pulled us into service because we were servicing those families. Mm. And what I began to look at was, all right, now that we're here, can we leverage our relationships and marshal all of our resources, but do it in a bigger footprint? And what began to happen, Tim, is that we decided to reside at what we call that intersection of the sacred and the secular. Mm -hmm. You know, it was focused on what happens Monday through Saturday. We already knew we had strong programming on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And as long as we resided in that intersection, um, partnerships began to come our way. People began to come our way. And then we do what we do, which was to execute. Yeah. And so in that, in the past five years, I've fallen in love with Lyndon and hopefully they like me uh, right. a little bit. Right. Um, but I think we we've been able to develop a special relationship uh, in terms of creating an environment 
which has um, yeah. off the chart potential. Mm. It really does. Good. Yeah. You know, thinking of that, uh, how have you been so successful in, br- in bringing community partners together to impact the lending community? Because we all know that's one of the challenges getting getting people on the same page. Yeah. Um, I think we're very good. Uh, and, and you'll appreciate this um, being the athlete that I know you are. Um, four years ago, uh, people can, can Google this or, or see it on YouTube. Adidas had a commercial mm. called its theme calling all creators. Mm-hmm. They never say the name of the product, mm-hmm. but they're all at this big table. Mm-hmm. It's, that entertainers as athletes as artists and they're just talking about the vibe and you see snippets of the product i saw that tim and i said that's us Mm. if we can create a big enough table in linden Mm. that no matter if you're young old you know older than 50 younger than 50 you're black white Mm. you're blue collar no Mm. collar Mm. you know um white collar Mm -hmm. if the table's big enough Mm. and people come and sit at the table and we give them an opportunity to do three things. We always talk about conversation, hopefully leads to community. Community leads to culture. Mm. And what began to happen around that premise is that partners began to say, yeah, that's a place I can see me at the table. And there are like-minded people mm. at the table who will not only um, come and work side by side, but will challenge me and hold me accountable. The beauty about running a faith-based initiative is that we can speak truth to power no matter who it is. I don't Amen. care if you are, as we like to say, a street pharmacist <laughs> uh, or you're the mayor, Amen. right? If you come to Linden right. and we're all at the table, we're going to speak truth to power mm-hmm. in the interests of people who will never get a chance to sit at that table. And I like to think that that's what began to resonate yeah. um, with uh, now more than 30-something different partnerships that we've right. established over the past five years. Mm. The City of Refuge Good Life Foundation is a 501c3 organization that is an affiliate of the First Church of God, led by Bishop Timothy Joseph Clark. Our vision is that everyone will have a better life through the establishment of a stable and sustainable home environment. We serve all residents of Central Ohio with a focus on residents in Southeast Columbus who are TANF eligible and or who fall at or below the federal poverty guidelines. We accomplish our mission in four targeted areas. They are workforce development, mother's initiatives and infant mortality, youth training, mentoring and development, and college preparedness for youth from impoverished backgrounds. To learn more, please visit our website at www.corgoodlifefoundation.org. That's www.corgoodlifefoundation.org. You know, you truly have a servant's heart for community. Uh, well, what's inside of you to help you stay committed? Because, you know, a lot of people, they come in and out of community. We've seen these before. But what, what, what's that in Adam Troy that allows you to continue in this fight? Yeah, I think part of it is, is certainly our DNA. Mm-hmm. Um, but I tell this story um, um, pretty often, um, almost two decades ago now mm-hmm. in Linden. Um I was unloading some boxes uh, in front of uh, the church, Mm -hmm. and there was a young man um, I could see out of my peripheral, Tim, coming down the alleyway, Um, and I was helping my uh, my sister-in-law, Brenda, unload some boxes, and I'm in the lower level of the church, and all of a sudden, we hear over the loudspeaker at that time that somebody had just broken into her car, taking something out of her Mm -hmm. car. So I come rushing back out on the um, the street. I can see what appeared to be the same young man running across the street. My brother, Pastor Troy at the time, came out the other door. And so I'm watching my brother chase, and the young man probably was about 13 or 14 years old. Mm. Um, and so I'm watching my brother chase this young man across Cleveland Avenue, dodging cars, and behind one of the houses we had just built mm. uh, with Habitat. And so I go um, south. And my idea was we would corner him, which is exactly what ended up happening. And so we're about six feet from him. And I can see, Tim, what he's got um, is a cell phone. Mm -hmm. He had reached in the car and taken her cell phone. Uh, And we call him Jamal because to this day, I call him the proverbial Jamal because we we still don't even know his name. But I could see the cell phone in his hand. And my brother and I began to approach him. And he pulls up his um, shirt tail and he brandishes a gun. 
And he's 14, 13, mm-hmm. 14 years old. And he says to us, <clears throat> back up, you don't know me. We go back to the church. So we're not about to take a bullet for our cell phone. Mm-hmm. We call the appropriate authorities. Inside of two hours, they had this young man. Mm-hmm. Here's the indictment. And this is what became our motivation. At that time, we're arguably probably one of the largest African-American churches in central Ohio. Mm-hmm. We got programs out the wazoo. We got a fair amount of visibility. There's nobody we probably can't touch within a phone call or an email. Jamal lives six doors down from us in a prostitution house. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know him. And so that to this day has become my clarion call saying it doesn't matter how big we are, how good we are. There's still somebody out there that we have yet to make a connection with. Mm-hmm. And so if you look at the mission statement mm-hmm. of, of the Development Foundation, it's not creating more programming. Mm-hmm. The mission statement is creating a connected community. Mm-hmm. That young man's words still continue to haunt me mm-hmm. to this day, but it also became the rallying cry inside of me saying, you know what? We may be doing okay from the outside looking in, but I guarantee you there's a Jamal six doors down from us. We don't have enough of a relationship to prevent him from taking from us, Mm. not to partner with us. And so every day, man, that's the motivation. Like, where's the next Jamal? Mm. Yeah. As you were sharing that, I was thinking about uh, the role of the church today. Mm -hmm. You know, Um, can you speak a little bit more on that connected uh, community that connected, being connected, because you see a lot of churches, and the reality is some of the big churches members may not live in the area. Yeah, but that connection. Can you talk yeah. about how, how how can churches build that connection in the community? Fair, fair question. Oftentimes, um, black and brown folks who live in suburbia get criticized for living out there, mm-hmm. right? And what I say to folks is, it's not necessarily about where you live, right? Mm-hmm. I mean that that does have its merit. It's about where you spend your time mm. and your dime. Most folks who, uh, quite frankly, live inside the inner city, wake up, and they leave the inner city to go to work or to go to school. Mm. Most people who live in the suburbs wake up from the suburbs and come into the inner city. So there's a fair exchange mm. there. Symbolically, what I hold up in, in terms of just sort of answering your question, no matter what the religion is, if you take the, the cross as the symbol Right. The cross has two planes, vertical and horizontal. And what the church has to remember is that we are obligated to operate on both planes. Mm. What the universal church typically gets comfortable with is operating on the vertical plane. That's what we do on our Sabbath. That represents your relationship Mm. to the deity. We do that fairly well. Mm. Where we often fall short at is on the horizontal plane. That's where the access is. Right. And so. The church has to remember our approach is a balanced approach if, in fact, you're going to truly represent the cross. Mm -hmm. Most church, well, I should say a lot of churches, right, have an unbalanced cross. And the community is smart enough to look Mm -hmm. back and say, oh, man, you're not really interested in me. It's all about what I can do for you on your Sabbath. Um, My brother's teaching a class to our senior staff, um, and he reminded us that at its core, The church is called to give comfort to those who are afflicted Mm -hmm. and to afflict those who are comfortable. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, that's what we miss as the universal church. If we hone in on that, we'll always stay at that intersection of the cross, which, again, I refer to as the intersection of the sacred and the secular. And I think that's the challenge Mm -hmm. of, of, of the universal church. How do you stay at the intersection where you are relational enough? to function and can be seen as a credible messenger on the horizontal plane, but you never lose sight of why we're here in terms of your relationship to the deity. Mm, that's awesome. How, how'd you miss that calling for ministry? Listen, you're sitting, man. You're sitting in here preaching now. Well, there you are know. enough of those in our family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're sitting in here preaching, you know. You're, you're, uh, Adam, your work in the community has been called innovative, versatile, and always centered on the end user. Yeah. End user. I'm curious to your meaning uh, that commitment to the end user. Yeah, the end user is, and we sort of referenced the end user early on, is the person who's in the shadows who's never going to get a chance to sit at the table. Mm-hmm. And so whether I'm in the barbershop or I'm in the boardroom, I have to represent that person's interest because that may be that single mother who's never going to make more than $30,000, who's working two and three shifts just to keep a 
uh, a roof over their heads or to make sure that the ki- her kids can go to school. My responsibility with the gifts I've been given is to make sure that I represent her interest. To me, she's the end user. Mm. So oftentimes we get people who support us because when they show up, they know I'm not in that room representing my own agenda. I'm speaking for Miss Robinson mm-hmm. or Mr. Williams, right? Mm-hmm. And so the end user for me is always, at the end of the day, whatever we're talking about doing, whether it's a person coming into the community, whether it's building a new place, whether it is introducing a new product, the people who live, um, rest, or worship here, they are the end users. How will their lives be enhanced by that thing? So I'm always focused on the end user benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, last as we wrap up, uh, this has been a great conversation. Can you issue a challenge to the audience, the importance of being involved in the community? Yeah. uh, And if I might, uh, Tim, let me sort of narrow that focus, Mm -hmm. given sort of where we started. You know, we we come from a... uh, a family of uh, black of males. Yeah. Um, and so we are, I think, always keenly sensitive about the challenge and, and the accountability and responsible um, to other black and brown men. Mm. Um, I was watching Animal Kingdom earlier in the year during COVID, as I do from, from time to time. It's an interesting analogy. In Africa, they were in Africa, and um, the African guy was leading a tour. Um, of folks whose uh, melanin are not like mine and yours. Mm-hmm. And so they came across a village that had been trampled. And so the guests ask what happened to the village. Mm-hmm. And what the guide shared with them is that it had been trampled by young pachyderms, young elephants. And so one of the persons who was a, um, a scientist said that's abnormal behavior because elephants typically, uh, that's not in their DNA. Mm-hmm. They don't trample over villages, mm-hmm. right? They're, they're usually pretty passive, right. right, until they are provoked. And so the guide acknowledged that and says that the adult, all of the adult pachyderms had either left mm-hmm. or been killed. Mm-hmm. And so this generation, this generation didn't have anything to model. I said, man, that's us. <laughs> that's us. Mm-hmm. And so, well, we've got so many of our uh, adult black males who are either invisible because they're not engaged or they've moved outside of the central city. We now got a generation that is literally trampling the village. Mm. They're killing one another. They're maiming folks. They're cussing in front of the elders. That's not who we are, man. Mm. And so my challenge Um, hopefully to the viewing and listening audience, particularly if you're an African-American male, you got to show up. Mm. You have to get visible. This is not at this particular point in time, given a sports analogy, it ain't a spectator sport anymore now. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you are generally concerned about where we're going as a people Mm -hmm. uh, and where we're going as a community, that power literally lies in the hands of adult black males. Mm. And, and showing up. Absolutely. And showing up. And Absolutely. that's why I know that you and New Salem have always showed up, mm-hmm. you know, and, and what you guys do is not about the presence. Correct. It's about your presence. That's right. You know, that's absolutely because right. Because the presence is going to come and go, you know, Christmas time, kid, that's toy, right. it's over with. That's but right. your presence and New Salem has been that presence yeah. in the community. Yeah. You know, so I want to thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the opportunity to come and yeah. share. Yeah, what a great episode on community service. Uh, uh, that brings us to the end of this episode. Thanks, Adam, for joining us and sharing your journey to building a legacy uh, in community service. We hope today's episode was encouragement to you all. As always, thanks for listening to Be A Baller Podcast. If you enjoy our show, please share this podcast with your family and friends. Be A Baller Podcast is available on all major podcast stations. Be sure to come back next week as we continue to discuss on how to build a lifelong legacy. Until then, don't forget to be a baller. This podcast was created by Coach Tim Brown. It was edited by Teron Howell and produced and recorded by the video production class of Worthington Christian High School.